Thank you everybody for joining us that has, has signed on so far. And we're so excited to be doing this. I'm Sean Adams. I'm the chair of the undergraduate and graduate graphic design program at Art Center. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to partner with Gloria Kondrup, who's the um, director of the HMCT on so many projects. And both of the programs are, have a wonderful symbiotic relationship. Um, I was especially pleased when Gloria said that she was planning to do this. Design education and typography is so critical. And um, it's, it's the spine of the profession. It's, um, it's the tool to language. And uh, it's just gotten more and more complicated to teach, as we all know. You know, like in, in my day, there was a Mergenthaler VIP <clears throat> that with about seven typefaces, and that's all we had to worry about. Um, and now with variable typography and motion and interaction, um, and just the opening of the doors to different cultures and different ways of, of, of communicating, it's, it's, it's a vastly complicated and incredibly exciting place to be. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Gloria. I am so thrilled you're doing this. I wish you truly were physically across the railroad tracks from me as you usually are. Um, but, but at least we're here virtually together and your guests are remarkable. I, you, you, you have the best party group in the world. <laughs> this is, you need to plan every dinner party I have from now on. But, uh, so, so thank you, Gloria, so much for doing this. Well, thank you, Sean. I really appreciate it. And thank you everyone who's attending uh, today. I, I want to say that um, the Design Educators Typography Intensive um, is about effective teaching should be shared and not kept secret. Um, it also continues the legacy of uh, Art Center Professor Leah Hoffmitz Milken, who is a dedicated educator for over three decades. And she had a profound dedication to teaching and to her desire to give back to her students and fellow um, educators. So she was intensely interested in the effects of technology and changing cultural influences on the design of letter forms and the role of typography and graphic design and visual communication. So um, I'm so happy this is our first. Yes, it will, there will be more. And I want to thank Art Center Sean Adams and Google, because Google has enabled this to happen. They're our partner in this program. And we're gonna take you on a journey through four different modules. Our first module is the discussion with my wonderful panelists on the design and typography archives, the importance of in terms of research and importance of it in terms of teaching. Your panelists today are, I mean, I. If you haven't read their bio on our website, then shame on you. Um, it's a marvelous, marvelous, marvelous group of educators and researchers and designers. Stephen Heller, Louise Sandhouse, Saki Manfundikwa, I'll get your name right one day, Saki, <laughs> and Jennifer Whitlock. Each one of them will be talking about very specifically about different areas or different types of archives, how archives have changed, how they've used archives, why we have archives, and the importance of the role of archiving. So I'm gonna turn it over immediately. They'll do about a 10 to 15 minute presentation. Then we'll all gather back and they will do um, a panelist. They'll be able to have a discussion amongst each other. And hopefully we'll have time for some Q&A. Then after that, we're gonna take a break. And those of you that were fortunate enough to sign up for our classroom, we'll have a little more intimate discussion. So I'm gonna ask Stephen if you'd like to start and give us your viewpoints on design archives. Well, thank you very much and I'm happy to start if this thing will work. Okay, so um, my little part of this is building a design archive or where to put your stuff, uh, spaces of the essence. Uh, there are a few ways of creating an archive, evolutionary parts of the process. First you hoard, then you collect, you document and catalog, you archive, you catalog some more, and you curate. So first I'm going to take you through the hoarding stage. Uh, anybody who's ever 
been a designer, has also been a collector and a hoarder. Uh, this is one of the more famous hoarders in the world. His name is Horst Moser. Uh, he has an airplane hanger virtually. Uh, physically, it feels like an airplane hanger, uh, where he keeps his humongous collection of magazines. Any German magazine you've ever wanted to find, any European magazine you've ever wanted to identify and look at for research purposes or just to have an ecstatic moment looking at great design is in this guy's uh, uh, place. Uh, it's filled from floor to ceiling with uh, vintage and relatively contemporary and contemporary magazines. As far as I can tell, there's no cataloging system. However, when I was there, uh, I was able to find three magazines that I needed for a project that I was working on. So there was some method to this crazy madness. But this is how archives begin. They begin with lunatics uh, who make it their uh, business to collect. Uh, those of us who consider ourselves lunatics have to take certain uh, drugs to stay calm, cool, and collected. Uh, I take a, a form of Zalatan that re decreases desire. I take a book reducer. Uh, I take Prozacotype for uh, typographosis and the others you see here. Uh, if I don't take them, this is what I turn out to be. Uh, this is what I wake up like every morning. So we go from hoarding, which is something of an illness, to collecting, which is something a little more disciplined. Uh, and in addition to discipline, is, it's addictive. So this is an apartment that I had uh, where I kept my addictions. Uh, it was a fairly sizable space, not like Horst Moser's, but it was uh, reaching uh, un unlivable proportions. And part of my collection was design reference books and journals. Uh, one of the books I've done is on a hundred design journals, and I'm sad that it never got the uh, attention that I think maybe not the book deserved, but certainly the material deserved. Uh, this is another view, another angle uh, of these books that just ultimately uh, grew to uh, stalagmite and stalactite proportions. Uh, in addition to books and paper, I've been uh, a collector of product mascots and mini mannequins. Uh, the mini mannequins you can see on the left, uh, at least it's on my left, it may be on your right. And they became a book, uh, as most of my collections do. And I'll talk about that momentarily. And there are also uh, tins and uh, counter cards and all sorts of advertising ephemera, which as a, a group of things is just a collection. Uh, when you break the, the collection down, you break it down into typography, uh, illustration. Uh, you can see it through the lens of stereotype. You can see it through the lens of politics and commerce and technology and fashion. Uh, these graphic design touches all of these areas. And uh, what I find the most uh, productive in going through archives is the amount of material that does indeed find categories other than the most obvious of categories. Uh, so, 
as I said, in addition to paper, I also collect uh, three-dimensional objects because I see three-dimensional objects as three-dimensional posters. And uh, these items, which appeared in one of my books, Iron Fists, uh, are three-dimensional posters from the People's Republic of China. Uh, th this collection actually went to another institution. One day I decided I had enough, uh, or it was decided for me. We actually had to move our apartment and we found an apartment that could accommodate 375 lineal feet of books, uh, as well as some objects, but 50% of the collection had to go. And this is a major problem for anybody who hoards and collects. What do you do with this stuff so that it's still useful and it doesn't just get broken up and put into other people's collections where it multiplies kind of like fungus. Um, so this is what it looked like before moving out of that particular uh, apartment in New York City. Uh, some of the collections I retained and just displayed them for myself in a uh, cleaner environment uh, and in different houses. I have a couple of places and my wife has a, a studio that she owns. So we have three spaces that contain our respective collections, all of which get documented. Uh, uh, from the chaos that you saw earlier, uh, it was, I designed a library or a library was designed for us by an architect that holds uh, the volumes and uh, makes it slightly easier to find things when I need them, but not entirely. Through that door on the right is actually uh, a condensed version of what you saw in those earlier slides. Uh, archives have great value and in the last 10, 15, 20 years, we've heard more and more about graphic design archives and certainly typographic archives. As people begin to replay with wood type and metal type, uh, there are shops, museums and archives that have uh, uh, developed uh, this is in Firenze, Italy, where last year they had a design typography conference when we were able to still travel. And uh, the materials are available to use, which is one of the great things about an archive as opposed to a museum. Uh, an archive is about using material. Uh, this was also in Italy. And Anamia Impressori uh, is a print shop outside of Bologna. And uh, the owner of the shop, who also has a actual retail shop in Bologna, is a massive collector of wood type. And it's like every drawer you open is not just type at your fingertips, but a kind of sculpture. Uh, remarkable. And, and this kind of uh, organization is 80% of what an archive is, cataloging and organizing so that something can be found when it's needed. So from collecting and hoarding, we go to document and catalog. These are some of my documents. Uh, I've worked with my own collections. I've worked with other archives, uh, like the RIT archive, uh, which you'll hear about. Uh, I've worked with the Wolfsonian uh, and various other places to accumulate material that tell a story. The thing about graphic design history is it's all rooted in storytelling. And you can tell the stories in many different ways. Um, so I've told the story through different books that are everything from uh, eye candy to uh, very detailed histories. Uh, one of 
I, I've done 190 or so books. I actually have lost count, and I don't mean that to be uh, facetious. I just can't remember anymore. Um, one of the books that I most enjoyed working on was with my wife, Louise Feely, and it's called Typology. It's out of print. Uh, they wanted to put it back in print, but getting permissions would have cost uh, my son his college education. Um, that's another story that we should get into later, what things cost. Uh, Louise and I have done a number of books where we draw from aspects of the collection. Uh, we collect according to theme, according to uh, uh, context. Uh, we collect based on politics, social justice, uh, decoration, you name it, we find a way of fitting it into a thematic context. And one of the things I was very interested in was more of a decorative context. And one of the decorative elements that I was interested in was dimensionality. So we did a series of books, what we call the S series, because there's a book on scripts, slab serifs, stencils, and this one, shadow type, where we excerpted a lot of the material that we had in our collection and use it as a showcase for how these materials are used differently and have been used historically. Uh, both Louise and I are Art Deco uh, Amor Amorati. Uh, we love the Art Deco style. Art Deco, interestingly, is a, a pan epidemic, so to speak, of style. It appeared everywhere. Uh, it's a commercial style that developed after World War I. And it represents, in some case, cases, politics, and in other cases, pure commerce. Uh, and this was one of the documents we did based on eight books we did on Art Deco graphic design. Uh, one of the most successful books I've done is, is uh, 100 Ideas That Changed Graphic Design, which also lied a lot on digging through archives, a lot of archives, because what we were doing, Veronique Vienne and I, <clears throat> who worked on this with me, uh, we each determined what 50 I ele elements or events uh, have uh, uh, changed the way we practice printed communication, design communication, digital communication. And uh, the book includes, as you can see, a lot of different uh, thematic realms. And one of the first uh, major design historical books I did, I did with Seymour Quast, um, called Graphic Style, this is the third edition. We did a fourth edition, um, which takes it up to the present. And we're probably not doing another edition because he's turning 89 uh, in three weeks and I just turned 70. So it's time to go out and play golf. So we go from documentation and cataloging to curating. Now these overlap, these uh, disciplines. Um, curation is, takes place in a book, it takes place in a movie, uh, in a museum, uh, it takes place in movies, films are being done now based on catalogs, uh, archives. Uh, a lot of curation is now done through archives that are set up uh, to represent individual works and individual designers who have uh, achieved acclaim. Milton Glaser, who passed away two weeks ago uh, t 
today um, has a center at the School of Visual Arts Study Center and Design Archives where a lot of his work is uh, kept on uh, file and available to students, can be accessed by scholars very easily. Beth Kleber, who is the uh, curator uh, and archivist. Um, what's great about these archives is that they are indeed online as well as in the physical form. And uh, because graphic design is a multiple form, uh, you can have the Milton Glaser archive, but you can also have the same pieces in every other archive, in HMCT's archive. Uh, that these materials are not so precious, even though they're precious to us, that they can't be multiplied and put around the country. Uh, and that's Milton uh, shortly before he passed away. He was still working. This is uh, a clean version of the Milton Glaser archives. It's much too small for all the collections that are being accumulated. Uh, which include collections by, uh, of, that is, um, Keith Goddard, who just passed away, uh, Chermayef and Geismar, Ivan passed away last year, um, Tony Palladino, who passed away two years ago. Um, it's handled very beautifully, and the act, the access to the materials is uh, very impressive. <clears throat> I can call on a Monday and get what I'm looking for no later than Tuesday. Uh, many of the designers that you are familiar with, and many of them who you're not, do websites. You all do websites. You, they're promotional for you, but some of the older designers, like Seymour Quast, uh, has his own archive online uh, designed by him. So it has his personality and all the materials are available to see digitally and also purchasable, uh, which I'm sure many people are uh, overjoyed to hear. I certainly love pressing the button that says uh, shopping cart purchase now. Uh, that's Seymour. Seymour recently built uh, with Paul Lachere, his wife, uh, a new house, which is right near where I am in northern Connecticut, um, about 10 minutes away. Um, and he built an archive in the place that is, uh, we hope, waterproof. Uh, temperature controlled and his flat fire files are filled with tons of stuff. Uh, I had the great uh, joy to be around when he was cleaning up his earlier archive and there were these boxes ready to go to the uh, transfer station, the dump. And uh, they were full of mechanicals, drawings that he had done with cell attack overlays. And I just, picked them up, threw them in the back of the car, and I've had them now sitting, waiting to be done with, uh, to go into yet another archive where some scholar or student will find it fascinating, particularly that it's the old method of creating artwork. Uh, some of the things he keeps, posters, he's working on a poster book now, which will document all the, 150 posters he's done. Uh, he's documented through many books that I've worked on with him. Uh, and he also documents the publications that he's done as uh, what I call an author entrepreneur. Uh, one of them is The Nose. And I was the editor on about half of the, uh, uh, the run, maybe more. Uh, and this was all kind of uh, festschrifts. They were ways of showing 
themes that he was interested in and how he could deal with them in a variety of different styles and concepts. And they're really a joy and they too are for sale. This is part of this uh, beautiful house that Paula designed. Uh, his archive is on the bottom or so-called basement floor, except it doesn't seem like a basement because it's fully windowed. Uh, and then he has a studio above uh, the archive, as does Paula Cher. And like everybody, he has books, many of which will need to find a home. Uh, uh, he has his sculptures. This is a metal sculpture. He's done many of those. And where these will reside after he's gone is anybody's guess, because that's the problem that we have today. Uh, where do these physical pieces go? And where do they go where they can be maintained and uh, serviced? Just another of his earlier works when he was making little puppets and one of his more recent airplanes. He's been doing a lot on the subject of war. This is a book that he and I did that's just come out yesterday uh, for Princeton Architectural Press, who's handling the Moleskin books. They're little books about inspiration and process that include an, a lot of uh, sketches as well as uh, unfinished work. In this one, we included a whole section on uh, uh, children's books that were never published. Uh, he has a whole section on drawing beards. And another of my uh, favorite archives is uh, Paul Rand's. Uh, Paul Rand's archive is housed at Yale, uh, and that's the archive where he keeps his job bags. So if you were to do some research, you'd go into a job bag and see all the permutations of a particular job, whether it's the Westinghouse logo or a Westinghouse uh, annual report or IBM work or whatever he was working on. He'd always keep a job bag in there on deposit at uh, Yale. But there were other materials. These designers, as you probably all know, keep lots and lots of stuff. And while some of it is not worth re retaining, most of it is. So where do you put it? You put it in institutions that basically ask for it. And in some cases they pay for it. And in some cases they get it as gifts. So one of the, th because I was close to Paul and when his archive was being disassembled for an auction, uh, they found things that they didn't think any scholarly archive would be interested in or would be auctionable. And I uh, was sent five big boxes of basically junk, but the junk all had uh, stories behind it. And these are some of those stories. I call them scribbles. They're his little drawings that he made as doodles while he'd be on the phone or with a client or by himself thinking about ideas. Scribbles was supposed to turn into a children's book. He had a thing about monkeys, I don't know why, but I have an entire folder, a Panaflex folder full of monkey drawings. Uh, he used animals in his graphic design. He used hand drawing in his graphic design. Uh, including hand lettering and the like. Uh, so there's a lot of that that is just scrap that he managed to save for whatever reason. Uh, I can only uh, presume what some of those reasons were. Um, but they're things he never showed to anybody. Uh, and there were many animals that he drew and he drew people, and he drew realistically, he drew cubistically, he drew surreally, he drew even pornographically. 
And he used those drawings in many of his ads, like this one for Architectural Forum, which is his typography and his drawing, and uh, this crazy little frog. And you saw before there were some elephants. Uh, I, he and the Eameses seem to have a fixation with elephants. I guess it's because it's such a well-designed animal. But here he used uh, an elephant made out of cut paper for a Fraser car, Fraser Kaiser car ad. And I throw this in again because it's a doodle. Uh, and it's, you just, when you're an artist, you have a pen or a pencil and you just make things. So this was the basis for something that never occurred, another um, children's book called The Fez Family. And these are ads that did appear and he used his drawings for them in a serial context. So every week there would be a new drawing and a new story to be told. Uh, the one with the uh, type was published and the one next to it without the type was a dummy ad that a member of his studio would put together. But all the drawings were done by Rand. I also found within this collection cards that he used in his lectures, uh, all really fascinating to read, to see what he was getting his inf inspiration from. Uh, this little sketch was done for the house that he, he and his wife designed. So from that little sketch came this Le Corbusier type structure. And recently we found that uh, uh, ProQuest has a whole archive of magazines. And if you look through the magazines, you'll find advertising from people like Paul Rand and others. Uh, I did a book, a biography of Paul Rand, and I also did one of those moleskin books, which include all the sketches that I showed and many others. Uh, there are many fans out there. This is a fandom. Uh, archives are often done by people who are start out as fans and then become experts. And this was done by Denny Lewandowski, and it's up as we speak. And he also did the next one uh, for Alvin Lustig. I did a biography of Lustig along with his widow, Elaine Lustig-Cohen, and Leondowski did the uh, uh, website, which is very rich and very accessible. Uh, and that's the beauty of the digital world. Uh, this was the Elaine Lustig-Cohen homepage that he did. Uh, museums are places where you go to see things, you can't touch them. This is a Fortunato de Pero Museum in Roverto, Italy, and it has so much of his material. There's also an archive connected to it at the museum in town. So you can actually work with some of the materials he were, uh, used and made, but also see a brilliant display of the furniture, the paintings, the objects, as well as the typography that he put together in a very safe and beautiful environment. So once you're finished playing around with collections and uh, everything that is your own, what do you do with it? You bring it to somebody who's going to preserve it. So I've given many different collections to different archives. The primary one, which includes about 500 individual objects, went to the School of Visual Arts and they show a few of the objects. And I sent an awful lot of material to the Wolfsonian Museum in Miami, uh, dealing primarily with my fixation with totalitarian regimes and the graphics they produced. And I've 
over the years given to the Cooper Hewitt Museum, often material that was made into a book. I no longer need the material in original form and it goes to them. And I'm obsessed with the history of graphic design. So I produce as many volumes as makes sense that where I can offer something new to whoever the reader is. And hopefully the reader is our students, scholars, uh, teachers, and practitioners. And that's it for me. I'm sorry if I went overboard. Thank you. Oh, Stephen, you, 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 you have a lot to go overboard about. I really say thank you. And I'm, I'm, everyone is just thrilled. Um, thank you, Stephen. It's, thank it, you. it's amazing, your body of work. Um, moving on to um, a next presenter, which would be Jennifer Whitlock, if she can start her video. Hi, Jennifer. Hello. Hello. And Jennifer is the archivist at the Massimo Vignelli archives at RIT. So Jennifer, if you want to take a deep breath, don't worry, <laughs> we're not rushing anyone. You know, I've decided what might happen is we might not have a panel discussion, but everything's so vastly interesting. So uh, Jennifer, I'm gonna let you talk about the, um, of what I would consider a very well-established institutional archive. Would that be correct? Yep. I, well, I'm trying to establish it. <laughs> well, um, why don't you share your screen with us and, um, I hope you can see that, right? Does that look good? Um, thank you Looks so, fabulous. thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that confirmation. Um, thank you so much for inviting me here today. I never turned down an opportunity to talk about design archives, um, especially on such an interesting panel. Um, but I have a bunch that I wanna show you, so I'm just gonna get right into it. Um, I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about what's in my archive. Um, and also the value of it, and then how do you access it. Here is the Vanelli Center for Design Studies, where I am the first and only archivist. Um, we're on the campus of Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. We opened to the public in 2010. We are part of the College of Art and Design, and we are not part of the library, so it's a little bit different. Um, and I haven't physically been there since March, so it's a little strange to be away. Um, it's a three-story building. Um, we have two stories of galleries and two storage vaults for the archives materials, plus a, kind of a multi-purpose study room slash classroom slash meeting room slash cool place to host a lunch, you know, all of the above. Um, we have over 40 different design collections. Um, I'm still processing, but I guess we have about 3,000 linear feet of artifacts and over a half a million artifacts in the archives. If you haven't guessed, we are named for the Italian modernist design duo, <laughs> Lella and Massimo Vanelli. Um, about two thirds of our collection, about 2000 linear feet of that 3000 linear feet total is Benelli. Uh, not only did they give us their entire professional archives, they also designed our building, our galleries, they curated the exhibition in our galleries. It's a very, very Benelli experience at the Benelli Center. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with their work, but I'd like to give you kind of a really quick overview and hopefully you'll see some things that surprise you. Um, they have well-known transportation graphics, um, including the short-lived but beloved subway map for the New York subway, as well as the signage and um, for both the New York subway and Washington DC Metro. Um, they did a, a, quite a bit of graphic identity work, including Bloomingdale's, American Airlines, tons of packaging. Um, from shopping bags to wine to food to even the first IBM personal computer packaging. Hundreds of publications, um, magazines, newspapers, guidebooks, uh, monographs on art, design, architecture, photography, etc. Posters, of course, these are some of my favorites. Um, and of course, the Stendig calendar, which has been in production every year since 1966. Um, even typefaces. Um, sometimes they did custom typefaces for clients, um, like Blooming Type is the typeface they did for Bloomingdale's. 
And I make this point, yes, typefaces, um, it's often a point of contention with Massimo, famous for saying you only need six typefaces, and did this exhibit in 1991 at the School of Visual Arts where he said, out of thousands of typefaces, all we need are a few basic ones and trash the rest. Um, we can talk about that more later. Um, they also did, worked in three dimensions, right? Lots of product design. Often it's Massimo is credited for graphics and Lella is credited for the three dimensional work, but they are often a team on these things. Um, dishware, furniture, et cetera. Um, they also did interior design. Um, you can see St. Peter's Church here in black and white, which is one of the few interiors still intact that you can visit. They welcome you to come tour it. Um, and as well as even fashion design, modernist, timeless fashion design. Um, they also designed a boutique at Barney's to display their fashion um, clothing line. Um, I mentioned that we have over 40 design collections. So uh, another area that we have quite a bit of material is Unimark International. Um, the Benelli's helped found Unimark when they first um, settled in the US um, and they became one of the largest design firms in the world. And we've had several donors give us more material to expand the Unimark collection. And in fact, if you have Unimark related materials, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and we have a number of smaller collections, examples of posters and other graphic design materials. There's some familiar posters that you probably recognize, some familiar names, some names you already heard from Steven's talk. Um, and this is, not even a complete list, but these are some other donors, um, designers, filmmakers, heirs, you know, everyone who's given us um, materials and it's certainly not complete. Sometimes I can't keep up with the rate that things arrive at the archives. Um, so, but we can talk about that more later if people have questions. So why do we do this? Why do we preserve all of this stuff? Well, we're busy over here, I'm busy. Um, we've had over 5,000 people use the archives. Um, six out of people from six out of seven continents have visited. I'm pretty sure no one from Antarctica has visited yet, but, um, and I've answered or tried to answer over 500 research questions, right? As with any archive, people use us for historical research. Um, I use this as an example because this is a very common question, like how do you recreate super warm red, AKA Benelli red? Um, by the way, that is Pantone 172 or possibly 2028, in case anyone wants to answer to that question. Um, most of this research also informs publications, um, whether it's a book, an exhibition catalog, a magazine article on a website, you know, we provide content all the time for this. And sometimes that results in exhibitions. Very rarely we loan artifacts, but occasionally we do. Um, but it's not just for scholars. Archives are for everybody. Um, a really common practice that I have is that people um, come to visit the archives and I put out, I curate a display of stuff based on their interests um, so they can look at stuff. Um, often there is things in the archives that can't be found anywhere else. So um, it can be a great way to inspire design process. We have lots of design process. We have prototypes, we have sketches, mock-ups, you name it, <laughs> we have it. Um, the Benelli saved a lot of design process. So many sketches. Um, rumor is Massimo is never without a pencil in his hand and he saved so much of it. It's an incredible resource. So many sketches and even sometimes some commentary from Massimo about those sketches. There's also a lot of stories to be told from the archives. Um, in addition to the designs and the design process, we also have correspondence, uh, clippings, and other ephemeral items that will also tell a story behind these designs. And this is um, related to a debate they had at the Cooper Union when the subway map was ending its term. And this is a little bit of a, a quote from Massimo about the event. <clears throat> There's also a lot of ephemeral things that weren't meant to be saved or aren't normally saved or very rarely saved. Um, you can see Bloomingdale's gift certificates, airline tickets, even American Airlines matchbooks, which we have a lot of matches in the archives. But also 
um, obsolete technologies and floppy disks and PsyQuest disks, which maybe some of you remember in the audience. Um, but that's a whole nother presentation if we're going to talk about digital preservation. And how do you get to the archives? How do you find out what else we have? Um, I am frantically digitizing. I have been digitizing for many years. Um, hopefully, very soon, I'm going to be able to have a website where you can go and search through things. So stay tuned for that. But it's not a simple process because we have artifacts of all shapes and sizes. And so digitizing it is not straightforward. Plus, it all takes lots of metadata to make it findable. For now, you can look on social media. We have a Facebook page and a Twitter page where you can also find out about events or other related information about the Vanelli Center. We have a Tumblr blog that's dedicated just to the work of the Vanellis. Um, and that's also searchable, so that's good if you're looking for something specific. Um, we're on Instagram and Pinterest, and I've taken the time to make some creative boards on Pinterest, so it's kind of fun to look at, so please check that out. Um, there's a couple of hashtags that I started in order to help people find stuff. So Manuals Monday is um, just for graphic standards manuals, which are extremely popular. So if you're interested in manuals, please check out Manuals Monday. Um, and Design Archives started as you can see some graphics here that my ex-colleague Katie Nix created for me for Archives Month a couple of years ago, where I wanted to push archivists and archivists to think about design and designers to think about archives during archives month and so created this hashtag and I encourage anybody who's showing off design archives or is interested in design archives to come along participate. Um, the other way that you get access is you contact me, ask the archivist. Um, I'm the finding aid, I'm the inventory, I'm the expert, I'm the one who can tell you what you can't find online. Um, please email me. If you want to see more, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, thank you so much. And please email me and follow us on social media. Thank you. Um, <laughs> great, Jennifer. Thank you. And thank you for, um, you know, again, we'll have a little more discussion later. I really appreciate you being here. And I know um, it's amazing when you see such an intensive work on one person and to know that it's accessible. I didn't realize there were... 500,000 pieces. Oh. That's but, a, a guess, a guess. It's, it's a, least. probably a good guess. But, <laughs> so moving on, I would like to have Louise Sandhouse now as we start to look at the movement of archives from what I would consider traditional housing of archives, whether it's at Cooper Union or at RIT, to a fantastic project that Louise Sandhouse was the moving and driving force behind the, um, I'll let her explain what her new project is in the archives. So please welcome Louise Sandhouse. Thank you, Louise. All right. I'm gonna talk about the democratization of research and archives. This may be a bit of a wild ride, so I hope everybody will hang on. Um, the cannon has fallen. Final shot from the post-colonial movement came with the recent announcement by Yale's art history department that it will discontinue its course, Introduction to Art History, Renaissance to the Present. So no longer will art be explained simply in terms of a European lineage. Um, these same challenges we're now seeing in graphic design history, it's and in graphic design, its own lineage, can no longer be explained as Bauhaus to the present. Already our heads are being pulled out of the Bauhaus sand. We are reminded by such designers as Sadie Redwing that native peoples had, uh, or indigenous peoples had graphic language for eons as seen here in our graduate thesis project at NC State. What we see is a beautiful detailed story of her experience during her studies at NC State communicated using a Lakota um, shape grammar that she put together, but it comes from these traditional forms. There's also the recent revelation that the abstract motifs and color palettes found in the work of Annie and Joseph Albers 
long preceded the 20th century um, as the Albers discovered when they encountered works that were created before Mexico was colonized, um, what has been known as pre-Columbian. And they discovered this during their travels in Mexico between 1935 and 1967. So you see on the screen uh, a photograph by um, the, the um, Josef Albers on the right. Um, and you see uh, his work on the left and the bottom, so you can see those forms as well. There's also W.E.B. Du Bois's visualizations that were created in the late 19th century to represent the lives of Black Americans. Um, these data portraits, what he called them, utilized an abstract language, an abstract visual language, that clearly preceded the Bauhaus, we're talking about the late 19th century, even though the vocabulary seems to reference it. And again, the Bauhaus was in the 20th century from the 20s. So the story we've been telling for so long about graphic design lineage is clearly just one story when there were many. Um, conversations with colleagues, um, more recently have revealed a like-minded community of educators thinking expansively about the scope of design history and new pedagogical practices. Uh, I was uh, particularly inspired by Silas Monroe and Ramon Tojadas' cheeky throwing the Bauhaus under the bus workshops, which encouraged students to consider and create their own personal lineages Students uh, consider diverse, relevant ingredients that inform who they are as designers um, that go beyond the only one that until recently has mattered, the European lineage or the European one. If this singular narrative, meaning the European narrative, Bauhaus to now, uh, has been the one informing and shaping our trajectory as designers, then how will new stories of the past and of now shape a new generation of design and designers is the question that I'm asking. Um, my own encounter with a different lineage of graphic design history came in attempting to discover and reveal California's own unique contribution to graphic design. Uh, what I found was that there was a vast number of unrecognized or underrecognized designers, or even some designers who it wasn't clearly recognized that they were in California. Um, and there were considerable, remarkable bodies of work. What I also realized is that without enough research to unearth these discoveries, and enough archives where the work can be preserved. Um, so Steve showed some archives, um, Jennifer showed an archive, but for a huge, huge, huge amount of uh, graphic design, it's just gonna end up in a dumpster because it's just not gonna go in a physical archive and that history will be gone. So what to do? Um, I began to fantasize. Um, first, I imagined uh, students not just as passive consumers of the canonical narrative, but as researchers and contributors to new historical narratives. I also imagined what if there was a virtual archive where anyone could add their research so it could be preserved. Uh, what if there was a new and much more expansive record of design history that was formed by diverse collective input uh, in order to provide a much more complex history? Um, so imagine that anyone could decide what should be part of our history. To test the idea uh, first of design students as researchers and contributors, in other words, makers of history. I tested a few approaches. Um, in this project that you're seeing here, this is representative of California Graphic Design Treasure Hunt, 
um, a project that I worked with uh, graphic design history instructors at various institutions, including Michael Dooley here at Art Center and Sharin Rabin at Cal State Northridge and UCLA Extension. Um, because most graphic design publications lack digital indexes, much of the history is undiscoverable. Undiscover in other words, you'll do a Google search and nothing will turn up unless it's, unless it's in somebody's bibliography. Um, so for the project, students hand paged through their library's physical copies of design publications, including print, communication arts, graphics, art direction, and Western advertising uh, to identify and scan lost articles. Uh, in the second project, working with my own CalArts students, we digitized the physical archive of the CalArts Design School. Yes, CalArts, uh, when it originated in 1970, actually had a design school. So what we created together is a digital design school archive. So this is a physical archive, and now we have a, a digital archive where everybody has access to it. Also at CalArts for historical survey of graphic design, for which I was filling the big shoes of Lorraine Wilde while she was on sabbatical um, in 2018, I asked undergraduate students to present new interpretations of a canonical designer that made the work personally relevant for them. And for grad students in turn, they conducted and presented original research on designers who had previously been overlooked and about which little or nothing had been written. So you see a few examples here. And finally, there was the graphic design uh, roadshow, uh, an event that might be described as Antiques Roadshow meets StoryCorps, if you know both of those. The class worked collectively to document his historical examples of graphic design that the public brought in to share. So we used uh, social media to publicize the event. Um, some experts uh, knowledgeable about local design history helped with information about the work, including uh, Sean Adams and Michael Dooley and Lorraine Wilde and Stacey Steinberger from LACMA. Um, that knowledge was then entered into a database. Um, the work was photographed and then an audio anecdote about the work was recorded. So how the work was personally meaningful to whoever brought it in. All of this informed what would be realized as a new resource to share and preserve all this research um, and so much more. Um, years in the making. <laughs> this has been a big fantasy for quite a while. As of last week, it's now been realized as the People's Graphic Design Archive. Our tagline is a virtual archive built by everyone, about everyone, for everyone. And here's a video explaining the project. And I particularly hope uh, at the end of the video, um, which we're going to be using for Kickstarter very soon, um, all the incredible people who have been part of this project. I have to say that um, without Briar Levitt um, in particular, this, this probably wouldn't have happened. And Brockett Horn has, is another partner on the project that's just been really crucial. So thanks to both of them, and here we go. Graphic design history has a problem. Much of it is either ending up in dumpsters or going unrecognized because it doesn't fit into the established canon or idea of what graphic design is. Without the proper archives and a diversity of materials and voices, much of graphic design history will disappear. But we have a solution. The People's Graphic Design Archive, a digital archive by everyone, about everyone, for everyone. This archive is different. The People's Graphic Design Archive includes not just finished products, but process, photos, videos, letters, documents, oral histories, anecdotes, articles, essays, and other writings. And best of all, it's created by us, the people. 
there are many types and combinations of visitors. They can browse or do a search for specific content. Entries feature subject, format, medium, designer, and date, along with other related information. Share, make sets, and leave comments if you have more to add to the story. The People's Graphic Design Archive is for research, education, inspiration, or just pure joy. We need your help to make the archive a reality. Join us in building the People's Graphic Design Archive. So, ta-da, here it is. Uh, we're gonna take a look at the actual site, but before we go, some last words. Um, for me, the current moment is a tipping point uh, for graphic design history, uh, an incredibly exciting and enlightening moment. I believe that we're about to reveal a considerably more expansive, more complex, an endlessly surprising story of our lineage. Together as educators and as students, I believe we are about to make history. Um, so here is the site. So I'm just gonna scroll through this and maybe we'll look at a few things. Uh, I have lost count. Brockett, who I, I think is here, or Briar, um, they might know how many works are in here now. Um, but like I said, we launched this a week ago. Um, this is um, a, this is collectively done. Uh, so people have been uploading, I have, we have three interns that have been uploading my 15 years of research. I know Sean has contributed. Um, many others have contributed to what you're now seeing. Um, Included in here are also archives. So this is becoming an archive of archives as well. So when you do use the search function um, and you are looking for someone or um, some type of work, um, hopefully uh, many things come up, including archives where that material might be found. Of course, this is dependent on tagging. Um, so you can see this is now going on forever. And I'm just gonna point out a couple of things here. Um, you saw the video. So videos can be put in here. There's a video, audio files, PDFs. Um, so a few things to point out. There's a, a title, um, creator, um, date, um, the, the format of the artifact, the file format, um, description can either be written or it can be quoted from another source. So this is crowdsourced, so that means that we build this information and we build all this data by anybody who might know the factual content and can add. Um, I mentioned there are archives, I think you know this archive here. Go right here. Um, and you can see the, you can get a sense hopefully of the diversity of types of material um, that are in here representing, again, this whole different lineage of graphic design. Here's a, a PDF that was shared. So I think I'm going to take us out with that. Thank you, Louise. I am amazed. And what it brings us to, though, is, and I, on purpose, I, mm -hmm. I organize this in a certain way, as we see the need, and I know we have a lot of questions, the need for changing archives or archives to change, or who can access archives? And I think one, one of the issues today is accessibility. And that's why I'm going to ask Saki to now um, do his presentation, because Saki, of course, works, works with um, uh, 
groups in Africa and Asia. And as we talk about accessibility, right, Saki, it's like, what do we need to do now? Who is this accessible to? I think archives has always been part of um, a culture that needs to change. So with that, I'm going to let Saki do his presentation. Okay, well, um, thank you, uh, Gloria. Um, I guess I represent uh, the rest of the world. Um, we have seen uh, what's happening here in America, in the North. Um, but there's uh, the rest of the world to think about. And like Gloria says, accessibility, I think it's like a big issue, a big problem with uh, some of us. So what I wanna share with you is pretty much my work um, in education, in design education. Uh, I was educated here in America um, had a Swiss design education. And I'll show you the transformation, my transformation from that to who I am today. So I come from a country called Zimbabwe, which means houses made of stone. Uh, this structure that you see here that was uh, built by uh, my people, the Shona people in the 11th century. And uh, at its height, it housed about 20,000 people. And so Zimbabwe means house is made of stone. That's uh, kind of where we got our name. And stone is pretty much sort of like encoded, you know, a DNA, because um, uh, we are among the top stone sculptors in the world. And I really think that Zimbabwe could uh, contribute to the world of character design. Uh, in animation and gaming. So in, in the late 90s, I decided that uh, my country needed a school, a design school. And um, I decided to call it uh, Ziva, which means knowledge in my uh, Shona language. And it's an acronym for the Zimbabwe Institute of Digital Arts. Digital is a term that I coined. And very quickly, we became very sort of like well-known, I want to say famous, for uh, encouraging our students to look within uh, for design inspiration. That Africa was really just full of design um, and that uh, it was there for our students to tap into. Um, I just want to remember and acknowledge the passing of someone very special to me, Margaret Martin, who taught at Cooper Union. And it was Margaret Martin who in the 90s kept bugging me to join the Cooper Union staff as an adjunct. And I kept sort of like making excuses but eventually in 1994, I agreed to teach at uh, Cooper Union. So she asked me, what are you gonna teach? And I said, I was gonna teach a course that I created called uh, Writing Systems from Non-Western Societies. And she couldn't hide the excitement. And um, it became a very popular class. And the work that was produced by the students was just amazing because this was the first time that uh, students uh, had such a, such a class where they looked at uh, the rest of the world or other parts of the world, the non-Western societies, the writing systems therein, uh, that they could tap in into for inspiration. So this was one of the books. Uh, I had gone to Yale and um, we took bookmaking and so I really loved bookmaking. I still love it. I still love books to this day. So at the end of the, uh, the, the course, they had to produce a, a book, basically do the research, write it, and then produce a book. But this student blew my mind 
Uh, she was from South Korea. And uh, her book was this cube because the writing system of, Hangul, of uh, Korea is Hangul, which is based on a, on a sort of like a matrix uh, that's a square, hence the book, which I thought was pretty smart. And uh, another student was interested in the Aborigine uh, writing called the dreamings that they draw in the sand. And one, uh, another student was interested in Sanskrit, the writing system from India. Then after a couple of years, that course uh, became experimental typography. And I quite enjoyed teaching that, uh, that course. And also teaching as an adjunct at uh, Cooper Union at that time was Paul Rand, who when I talked about that class, he scoffed, he turned to me and said, I, I, I bet you it's one of those courses where they teach nothing. What's, what's there to experiment? <laughs> to experiment about type is meant to be read, not experimented on. And then around that same time, I discovered Cranbrook, the work that was coming out of Cranbrook. I really like, I, I gravitated towards that work. I thought it was pretty exciting. And as an African, I could see there was a lot that uh, I could relate to. Uh, so I invited um, Elliot Elves, who was uh, a graduate from Cranbrook, and he came and gave a talk to my students. And at the end of it, some of my students kind of like were not impressed. So they said, ah, that's, that's crap, that work. And I said, yeah, I know it's crap, but isn't it beautiful crap? <laughs> so, because when I look at this work, I saw I saw this, the masks, the masquerades of Africa, the music of Africa. In fact, looking at that work, I heard dub music, kind of like also what uh, people like Brian Eno were trying to do with uh, things like uh, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts, where you can visualize this other world. So when I started my school, um, it was about type. Type design was the thing I was interested most in. And so the brief was very simple, create a typeface from nature. And this is what my students did. And um, uh, then there was a, a, a workshop that we did uh, as part of the Poster for Tomorrow initiative. Poster for Tomorrow is, um, is a French-based um, organization. And each year they have a theme and then they dispatch designers to different parts of the world. Well, they used to. Uh, we got get, uh, Gertz Gremlich, an amazing, brilliant poster designer. And the theme that year was uh, education is the right. So this is the work done by my students. Some logos. And so um, I noticed that like around Harare uh, weekly, there were posters uh, uh, advertising shows, different music. Zimbabweans love live music, so do I. And so when I saw these posters, I was really intrigued, uh, intrigued, and I went in search of who was making these posters. And these are silk screen posters. So I discovered these guys called the Highfield uh, Art Club. And basically, it was a, a, a group of like, I think about six guys. And uh, how they did their work was, there was the, uh, the guy who drew, the, the, who did the lettering, and then he would cut out the letters. This was all done on newsprint, 
we cut out the letters and then the stencil would be uh, glued onto the back of the screen and then they would squeeze the colors through. And I was totally just like impressed by these guys that I had them come to the school to run workshops uh, for the students. After my brush with Hangul, with my student at Cooper Union, I really became interested in other writing systems from different parts of the world. And uh, I just thought that the story of Hangul is quite brilliant, that um, uh, King Sejong decided that uh, the people of Korea uh, deserve their own writing system, because at that point, up to that point, they were using Chinese. And so he created this writing system, which they still use today. And that typeface has been able to keep, um, the, it's the identity of the Koreans, although they are divided by political ideology from the North to the South, but still united under one um, writing system. Then of course, the story of Sequoia who I think was just like a brilliant, brilliant uh, man. Uh, he designed the Cherokee script in 1806, single-handedly. What I love about it, which I always encourage my students to do, is that he, he, he was quote unquote illiterate uh, in terms of the Roman alphabet, but he was intrigued by the letter forms. Uh, and, uh, and books, concept of books, which he called Talking Leaves. And uh, Johnny Cash made a, a song about that. Uh, that's on YouTube. And uh, I really think that uh, Sequoia deserves a place in any history of uh, graphic design uh, in America. And so he took the, letter, the letters that he liked and gave them new meaning in Cherokee. Then in 2004, my thesis became a book, uh, African Alphabets, which uh, collected all the writing systems that were developed by Africans, but mainly Sub-Saharan Africa. I didn't include uh, Egypt because Egypt has been really been written about widely and I caught a lot of flack for well, not uh, including uh, Egypt. So I'm working on a new edition of the book, uh, which will have uh, a, a lot of essays. There's been a lot of activity since my book came out in 2004. So there are people who have taken uh, this to another level, even up to the level of creating typefaces, uh, uh, like Jamra and Patel, they created a typeface suite called uh, Kigalia, which has been licensed by uh, Microsoft and will soon be available on computers. So because of the book and the school, I was invited to speak at TED 2013 in Long Beach, which sort of like, I think helped in spreading my philosophy on design education. I'm going to share with you just uh, two of some of the African, young African designers who were touched by my TED talk, like Simon Charaway from Ghana, corporate uh, identity programs. Then there is Osman Chuma from Zimbabwe and who's working in South Africa also being inspired by um, Debele and uh, Nguni simple writing to create uh, identity programs. And I've run workshops uh, from, I've run workshops in Africa, in Europe, and here in the States, South America. Uh, but I remember, and I like this one, uh, the most because this was Ecograda in Turin uh, in 2006, I think. 
uh, and my workshop was on uh, creating Thai faces uh, inspired by African alphabets. And I had a student uh, body from all over the world. So the theme was multi-vessel for that uh, conference. And uh, so initially they, they created uh, letter forms of the word multi-vessel and then developed that into typefaces like this and that. And I've run workshops also, like I said, in other parts of the world. This was from South Africa uh, this year in February. The one on the left, uh, the student's sister is undergoing um, uh, treatment for breast cancer. So she called that uh, typeface, the cancer alphabet. And on the left is a student from India and uh, Hannah. And then um, I ran a workshop at Binghamton, up, upstate uh, New York, on the occasion of the Declaration of Human Rights. I think it was the 70th uh, anniversary of uh, the Declaration of Human Rights. And because these students knew my uh, sort of like philosophy, they asked if they could uh, design their posters uh, in Chinese. And I said, of course, I was very happy that they asked. And so these are the posters that they did. And the one, the one about should your family be natural, it's really a Chinese thing whereby your family is your immediate family. And this student was questioning that, like, why should it be that way? And then I taught the same workshop at uh, Cornish uh, College here in Seattle, where I am right now. And um, these where they are posters. So in conclusion, I can say that um, my approach to teaching really is that uh, I think I can bring out the, the person, you know, like the design should really be, should design should be, should belong to the place and to the person, to the individual, uh, wherever they may be, whoever they may be whatever nationality they may be. And in, uh, in conclusion, uh, there is this movement going on now, the protests, you know, following uh, the, the murder of uh, George Floyd. And I just was like, I really, I liked how the whole world sort of galvanized uh, under uh, the Black Lives Matter movement but being in America at the time when it was happening, I really felt like there was a lack of empathy with um, indigenous peoples in, in North America. Um, I think they suffer the same brutality and violence uh, just like black people do. And I think while we are fighting this struggle uh, for black people, there should be empathy and solidarity with our Native American brothers and sisters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saki. Thank you, everyone. If I can, if I can ask our panelists to come back um, um, from hiding. So we, it's been a, a long morning, but I'm gonna give one question that I'm gonna ask everyone if they can briefly answer it. I guess, or maybe if you have the question that you think should be asked. And I think what I think we wanted to show today was a real shift of what we might consider what is archivable. And where do we look for our archives? It used to be just that we were able to go to a place. We had to go someplace to see materials. 
So what do you see as the future of archiving in terms of its value to number one education and to research? And how do you see it shifting in terms of accessibility? And uh, why don't we start with you, Stephen? Well, I think that um, if you asked that question three months ago, I might have given the same answer, but now it's even more critical now that we're in, stuck in this pandemic and uh, we're not going to get out of it for a while. I think uh, it gives us all a lot of time to create different kinds of archives that will be digitally um, uh, available. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I always thought, wouldn't it be great if I just had three months to go through all the crap that I had accumulated over the years and put it into little boxes and found connections between these things and found those things that I would ordinarily just shove in a box. And with the pandemic, I've actually been able to do that. And I found that there is archival material uh, that will be important and valuable to students who are now in a remote situation. Yeah, I and think, I think, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's it. I think we're now looking at new ways to find and to um, archive. Louise? Well, you're, I think what you're doing is the bridge right now, the People's Archive, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I just wanna say our mantra is, is preservation not perfection so you know this it, it's messy what's up there is messy and as a lot of people start adding and i want people to know that this is not just a resource for looking at what's out there <laughs> but it's also a place where people who are doing research can add because a lot of researchers like like i was talking about how these interns are are putting all my material up there because I've had all this stuff kind of like stashed away and couldn't share it with anybody, you know, unless I did another book, which is like, you know, that means, you know, so I've done two books. I, I'm not as, I'm not a Steve Heller. So a lot of this stuff would have just right. disappeared. And I look at all this material that Steve has, of course, he's not gonna be able to digitize all this and get it online, but he's telling lots of stories. I mean, what I'm interested in is what, as, as people decide collectively, what should be part of this history by, by adding to the archives, then what kinds of stories and interpretations happen? How do we make sense of this? You know, and I think we all know at this point, there's not a truth, it's stories about this right. and how they're meaningful and relevant. I think, I think we're finding that, and Jennifer, if you unmute, you'll be able to speak, but I, I think bringing it back to maybe a traditional archive, what's going to happen? I mean, we're now so far removed from seeing and touching, and Stephen and I talked about this, the actual touching and going and seeing of source material. I mean, yes, there's an advantage to what Louise is doing to make it accessible more than one story, you know, our archives have been mostly what we use here in the United States, Western. But so Jennifer, how do you think this new world will affect what you do in a very traditional archive? Well, um, those are excellent questions. <laughs> um, yeah, I have one minute. Uh, one minute. Um, well, number one thing I'd say what they're saying about making connections or telling the stories, different stories. I say that all the time about even the Vanelli archives. People think they know the story, but there's so much they don't know, right? And there are different ways to make connections to these pieces. It doesn't have to be it's Vanelli, right? You know, um, I, I would love to see, like, just when Louise was talking about cataloging things and like letting experts and researchers come in and add to the content. I would love to see that with the Vanelli archives, you know, to like let other voices say what they want to say about these things. I don't want it to be, I always say, 
you're allowed to criticize the Vanellis when you're at the Vanelli Center, right? And the hundreds of people worked in their office over the years from around the world and they went off and did their own thing. And like, where are those stories, right? Like, can we expand the story mm -hmm. of from starting from a traditional place or a kind of hero worship of the Vanellis? How do we expand that story? Expand it. Um, which, which brings it to Saki. Saki, in your teaching experience in Africa, if you had to say, what would you like to see in terms of what resources would you say could be most or better useful to expanding the experience of, let's say, your school in, in, in Africa? What would you like to see done? Um, so I ran a school of design mm -hmm. and multimedia for 20 years without funding. So if you were to ask me, what, what would I like? Money. <laughs> OK, besides money. the money, I mean <laughs> accessibility. Okay. Well, I think, I, I think that's, you know, even though we talk about how great and we have We'll wrap this up. I think what we see in what we see in 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 the um, in the digital world, I think, is a next step yeah. for accessibility. Yeah. I still think the actual whether you go see actual artifacts, yeah. whether it's 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 language script artifacts in Africa, or you go to Vignelli, or you go to Cooper Union, I still think there's something valuable in the touching and the seeing of the object. And with that, um, I think it's very, very important. And especially, you know, in a world of typography, in a world of metal type, as Stephen, you brought out, you know, to see actual letter forms, your relationship with the actual object is very different than your relationship on screen. Yeah. Um, I want to, yeah, because we're going to have to end in a second. Yeah. Saki, yes. Yeah, I just want to say that, um, um, like, I'm a holder. And <laughs> I have a feeling and, and, and this a proud, entire panel could be holders. A proud, proud holder. And I, I did visit uh, Stephen Heller's um, holding <laughs> place. <laughs> and it was incredible, you know. And I realized what's collectible. So when I moved back home, I even took my Gumby and I used to put it on top of the, uh, my computer and my students couldn't get it. They were like, but what is this? I said, it's Gumby. <laughs> well, I, I think that's the other thing for, uh, for, for what we can tell students is it's a question of, and what I see, whether it's the Vignelli archive or Stephen, your hoarding or Louise, <laughs> it's about depth. Archives are fabulous when they're about depth. They're, you know, and that's what makes, I think, learning and history. It's about the depth of what the archive is, whether it's a digital archive or it's a, a physical archive. It all has to be about the depth of the story, you know. And that's what I love about seeing primary materials and everything from letters, from sketches, that's when we understand the process of what went in. It's not just here's the finished product, here's the depth of the product. So um, what I'd like to say is I'd like to thank everyone. Thank you everyone for attending. And sure. I will see those of you in the break room in about uh, 10 minutes. So thank you so much. And I thank you very much, my wonderful panelists. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, this was great. Thank you.